どうだった今日は、うん、メッセージ分かったよく、うん、日本語あ、カップ持ってきたコーヒーカップ持ってきてるああ OK
little issue talk about it YouTube policies cannot talk about something against world system because of you do depending on the subscriber who are not believer in Christ Jesus so something against when you talk about LGBTQ something that they don't like the world don't like if I talk about it and absolutely that they will reject my video that's how they concerned over the, what you are filming and what you are not filming about it so as soon as if I talk about it and they will give her treatment and two weeks three weeks ban on YouTube but this is not how God is want God wants a number of events coming up. We have the SES, Southern Evangelical Seminary Steadfast Conference on the 13th and 14th of October. That's next week, right here near Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, Rock Hill, South Carolina, actually. I'll also be speaking at the morning services at First Baptist Church in Rock Hill that Sunday. Uh, also want to mention this coming Tuesday, I'll be down in Noonan, Georgia at First Baptist Church talking about the issue of transgenderism. We'll try and be correct, not politically correct. That's on October 10th. And then on October 19th, the Ohio State University for I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It'll be in the Ohio State Student Union, 7.30 p.m. Then the following week, we have Northwest Missouri State University, we have Missouri Western State University, and then on the 26th, Auburn University, War Eagle, right there. And on the 2nd, we have University of Cincinnati, that's November, that's coming up. Also keep an eye on the Monday night Zoom meetings, uh, or I'm sorry, the Monday night uh, the Monday night TV shows. We're going through the archaeology, the top archaeological uh, discoveries in the entire Bible. Go to crossexamine.org, click on Frank Turk calendar, you'll see it there. Uh, Neil, let me start with you on the question of how do critical theorists respond generally when people have to acknowledge we've made progress, at least it seems from a law perspective, we don't have laws that are discriminatory against minorities. We may have some discriminatory against majorities, but how would they respond to that? What would they say? Would they say? Great question. So critical race theory is the critical theory that's devoted to the study of race, especially with respect to law. And what critical race theorists, generally speaking, would say today is that they would acknowledge grudgingly that over de facto, or sorry, de jure racism, like the co encoded in the law, that has mm -hmm. largely gone away. However, they would strongly assert that de, de facto racism, covert racism, has replaced it. And people like Eduardo Benia Silva, who was the ASA president a few years ago, I wrote a book called Racism Without Racists. He even goes so far as to say that modern day de facto racism is no less powerful than Jim Crow. So a phrase they use a lot is racism never goes away, it just adapts. It mutates into new forms that are really just as effective and even more insidious than it was under Jim Crow and even under slavery. So that strikes us as bizarre, but it really is a central tenet of critical race theory. Yeah, deception never goes away either. It just morphs itself into something else. And uh, that seems like a very deceptive comment to me. Racism doesn't go away. It just goes underground somewhere. Where, where is it gone, Pat? Where Where is racism gone? If it's not in our laws anymore, where is it? 
Well, from a critical social theory standpoint, concerns around competition, egalitarianism, meritocracy, these kinds of perspectives that are often considered a kind of a cultural good, a collective good, in terms of a, an idea that's taken root. A critical social theory would say that actually a push for meritocracy, meritocracy competition, egalitarianism, this idea, this discourse that we're all equal now because now we're past the civil rights movement, that, that these ideas fail to get that the playing field is still not level. And to push this kind of discourse is, in effect, reifying the disadvantages that are still in place. And so this is why part of anti-racism's campaign and some of the comments and perspectives that Kendi has pushed for is that the way you deal with the racism is that you employ some racism of your own. And the, it would want to be nuanced. It would want to be thoughtful. It certainly can be the case that perspectives like, for instance, colorblindness, that is considered to be something that a lot of people would embrace, and hey, we're not seeing color, that's a, that's a good thing. But a critical social theorist would lump that in with meritocracy and egalitarianism, and competition is something that is just masking racism. And when we think about colorblindness, part of the point that a critical social theorist would make, which is somewhat valid, is that Colorblindness ideology can erase color. And so if you erase my color, you're almost erasing my ethnicity, you're erasing my subcultural background, and therefore I'm erased. And I don't want those things to be erased. And that point is well taken, and Christians and you know, people that are concerned about both perspective need to be thoughtful about it. But the problem is, it's just not true that in every situation where someone is making a point to not see color, that they're actually being racist. And in fact, when that ideology was more pronounced and people were coming to that in the 70s and the 80s and 90s, for many of those people that held that position, they were in fact not being racist about that position. And so the ones that are pushing for fairness and equality and egalitarianism and competition is tr are trying to open up spaces for all people. And so that is still a reality and still true, even if we need to uh, investigate how those perspectives could disadvantage some and, and could not deal with an unlevel playing field quite like it should. So our book is offering a nuanced perspective around these things and not drinking the Kool-Aid wholesale of critical social theory on these topics. Neil, if uh, critical theorists had their way, suppose they were benevolent dictators, maybe not benevolent, maybe that's not the right way to put it, but if they could just dictate the solution to what they see in our society, what do you think they would do? So one really uh, important word to understand is equity and uh, mm -hmm. versus equality. And critical social theorists yes. draw that distinction. Equality, they will say, is treating everyone equally, procedural justice, everyone gets the same treatment. And they will point out, though, that, that actually the equality discourse is flawed, according to them. It fails to recognize that we're not all starting from the same place. They would argue for it, equity. What equity would insist is that equity allows you to treat different groups differently, to not treat everyone the same, because they're not equally situated socially. Now, we can actually acknowledge that that's a reasonable idea in some cases. For example, if you say, um, we're not going to have a wheelchair ramp. Everybody can use the stairs. And you say, well, mm -hmm. well, wait a minute. Everybody, yeah, people in wheelchairs, people on crutches, they can all use the stairs. We're all equal. So, well, wait a minute. In this case, I think people that are in a wheelchair deserve different treatment because they literally can't use the stairs. That's an example of reasonable equity. We say we are treating groups differently because they just, they're actually handicapped. But our pushback is, but is that really the case that black people are analogous, say, to people in wheelchairs? That's almost very, in fact, it's very insulting. So we want to ask, is it really true that we need to treat people of color differently for them to even gain access to, say, education? That's where we want to, uh, we'd say, no, we don't think that is actually a good analogy. Uh, but they, they would, so if, what they would put in place is then a system of laws basically judged equity in terms of outcome 
what they would ask is, are these groups graduating and earning money and being successful at exactly or roughly equal rates? And if they are not, we have to put our thumb on the scale until we achieve equal outcomes. That's how we know that real justice have been achieved. If we see equal outcome, if it hasn't yet, then we have to put, make other laws that insist on attaining equal outcome. There, aren't there thousands of reasons why people arrive at different points in life that have nothing to do with their race? Sure. Doesn't that assume, as Kendi put it, that if there are disparities between, say, whites, blacks, and Asians, that 100% of those disparities are due to racism? Yeah, he says that in his book. Is that? And, yeah, he's he's yes. just wrong, and that's absolutely right. There are many factors besides race that influence group outcomes. And, and we actually excite Thomas Sowell quite a bit in one of the chapters yes. because he points out it's it's things like geography. You know, um, mountainous regions are economically poor compared to coastal regions. It's not because coastal regions have an unfair advantage or discriminating or oppressing the mountainous regions. It's because of their being landlocked, not experiencing trade, and maybe you're deficient in iodine from the seawater. So it's the, or the Irish potato famine. It blighted crops in Ireland and not in America because the fungus grew in Ireland. So these kind of historical contingencies just affect outcomes. We can't reduce everything just to one factor like racism. Pat, um, what would you add to what uh, Neil just said on that? Because it seems that if the, the solution to this is make everybody come out the same, that's just impossible. And scripturally, that doesn't even appear to be the case. We're not all going to be the, even the same in the afterlife, correct? Well, right. That, that position that everybody should be the same sounds on the surface as something benevolent and good. But it's actually not. Mm -hmm. that, that is not actually what we want ultimately because that would pretend that there aren't meaningful differences that have led people to be successful in, in comparison to others that haven't been successful. And we don't want to erase those meaningful differences. I teach at the college level. And I give exams. And sometimes I say to my students, you know, some of you made 100, some of you made a 50. So why don't we just do this? I just give everybody a 70, and, and we'll, all, <laughs> we'll all have the same. Now, yeah. raise your hand if you would like me to do that. And this is before I've given the grades back. And, uh -huh. you know, it's interesting. I'll have a couple of hands go up because they know they bombed it. Okay? And, and then I'll have some hands that don't go up. And so what we're getting to is that the anti-racist literature and, to an extent, critical social theory in general, want to take a one-to-one -one correspondence between disparities between blacks and blacks to equal racism and trying to make mm -hmm. everything monocausal. And this is a flawed, flawed perspective. And our book unpacks some of this as Neil has already articulated. And it's not just race, yes. it's things like gender disparities. Why are there so many male engineers and female, say, nurses? And is it sexism? Well, well no, actually, there are studies that you can point to that say it actually seems like women gravitate towards person-based professions and men towards object-based professions. And you can't engineer that as a society. It's just there are innate natures as male and female. So it's not it's not just about racial disparities. It's gender disparities. It's all, it's class disparities. It's educational disparities. They all put all of that under the oppression under the rubric of oppression and injustice. And it, and it can't it can't fit there. Yeah. And some of it is based on family structure yeah. too. That's what right. kind of family were you brought up in and what kind of choices did you make? What kind of talents did you have? There's so many reasons why people arrive at different locations in life. It can't all be about racism. A lot more with Dr. Neil Shenby and Dr. Pat Sawyer, their brand new book, Critical Dilemma. We're going to talk about how this is affecting the church in our final segment. And what can you do if you come across these ideas in your church? So don't go anywhere back in just two minutes. Forget about Facebook. The last 10 days we've been banned twice. And is unbanning a word? They put us under the ban. Christians and conservatives don't need to YouTube. Banned one day. Banned again. AFR programs are now live streaming on the AFA streaming app. Now you can get shows like today's issues straight from the source. Put it back on the net. Just say unbanned. Unbanned. Just search AFA streaming or visit streaming.afa.net to sign up. Hey, did you hear? 
Money Wise is different. It's now Faith and Finance with Rob West. Don't worry, Rob will still help build your faith while giving biblical advice about your finances. It's just a different name. From a diversification perspective, I like uh, properly diversified stock and bond portfolio, especially given where the market is right now. Faith and Finance with Rob West. Weekdays at 9 a.m. Central on AFR or catch the podcast at AFR.net. This is Walker Wildman with AFR, and we're sending Bibles. Here's Michael with Bible League International. Walker, the man Timbe, lives in Mozambique, Africa. He grew up as the grandson of the village witch doctor, so he had no idea who Jesus is. But he eventually married, had two sons. One day, those sons went missing. They put together a search party. They found out these boys had been murdered, killed at the hands of the grandfather and his world of demons and child sacrifice. This put Timbe and his wife into a severe depression. A Christian invited them to come learn about Jesus, and they have now come to place their faith in him but the story doesn't end there they've gone on to lead 200 people to christ who look at these two and they see people who have the grace and gumption to move forward in life and listen every gift today as we send bibles to mozambique and other parts of the world will be doubled walker five dollars sends one bible yes that's five dollars for one bible one hundred dollars sends 20 and 500 sends 100 bibles give generously at 800 yes word 800 yes word or visit sendbiblesnow.org send bibles now there's not enough women bricklayers. It must be sexism, ladies and gentlemen. No, not necessarily. We're talking to Dr. Neil Shemby and Dr. Pat Sawyer about their brand new fabulous book called Critical Dilemma. One other thing I want to mention, as you know, in public schools, we don't teach kids how to think. We teach them what to feel. That's why you want to be a part of our brand new logic course called Train Your Brain. If you want to be, if your uh, junior high or sixth to eighth grade wants to be a part of that, they got to sign up before October 9th. Anyone can take the self-paced course at any time, even though it's written for sixth to eighth graders. If you, you have not had a course in logic because you went to public school, you need to take the course. Go to crossexamine.org, click on online courses. You will see it there. All right, uh, Neil, let me start with you. you. You go through in chapter 13, and chapter 13 is worth the price of the book, ladies and gentlemen. The whole book is great, but... Um, I, the, the title of the chapter is Ideas That Will Devastate Your Church. So let's go rapid fire as we can. I'll go back and forth between you two guys. Uh, you can't cover, I know you can't make every counter argument to what these claims are. They'll have to get the book to go further, but just give us one idea on each of them. Neil, with you, first one. People of color in the U.S. are oppressed. Right, this goes back to the definition of oppression. I think the knee-jerk reaction is, of course they are, of course they are. But then you say, well, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that my, you know, my black friend or my Hispanic friend walks around every day being cruelly and unjustly treated by a tyrant? And usually the answer is, well, no, I don't mean that. Well, what do you mean? I mean that there are systems and structures which marginalize as a group blacks and Hispanics and other people of color. Well, that, my friend, is critical theory's definition of oppression. And if you're going to be consistent, you have to apply that definition not just to race, but to gender, to sexuality, to physical ability, and et cetera. And that's exactly why people like Black Lives Matter have lumped together racial oppression and gender oppression and queer oppression. So right back, we push back immediately and say, define your terms. What do you mean by oppression? And don't use the definition that is being foisted on you by critical social theory. As a group, though, Asians perform better than whites and blacks. So what would they say about that, Pat? Pat, what's, what's, their, what's their explanation for that? Part of the response would be that Asians are performing white, that they're being red. What? They're being red as white in culture, and that they're performing whiteness, and they've but they're doing better than whites, right? So and they've, they've they've improved on the, the regime of truth on the game, they've, they've improved on it, and and again, they part of the response would be your point that Asians do, you know, offer a, a, a counter veiling perspective on critical social theories uh, perspectives in these areas so how about let me let me give you one here pat um dealing with this there's actually a phrase that says whiteness is wickedness what does that mean well the term whiteness now in critical social theory has been embedded with all different kinds of ideas that are negative for instance genocide or oppression or this notion of white supremacy being tied to whiteness. This idea that 
whites control power and are dominant and are exercising their power in ways that are marginalizing and disenfranchising others. And so whiteness is a term that is onboarding all of that. Now, critical social theory would say that it's possible to be non-white, to be black or Hispanic, and be adopting whiteness as you know, genocide, colonization perspectives, colonizing perspectives. And, and, and so whiteness now has been uh, conveniently tethered to, in this country, slavery and Jim Crow. And since whites were leading in slavery and in Jim Crow in terms of oppression, now this term whiteness can be thought of as an oppressive state. And again, it's a little bit of a sleight of hand because they'll say that other groups can adopt whiteness too that aren't necessarily white. The problem though is that in typical conversation and even in the literature at points, there's a conflation between white skin and whiteness. And that if you've got white skin, well now you're conflated into this oppressor status because you are embodying whiteness. And we say that that is horrendous because if you study hermitology, the doctrine of sin, if you study anthropology, if you study phenomenology, if you study ontology, the nature of being human, phenomenology, lived experience and lived existence, well then you will see that all kinds of ethnic groups and all different kinds of skin tone have done all kinds of horrible things that when uh, that, you know, everybody has been uh, a slaver. Everybody's been yes. cruel and unjust. Genocide is not captive to just white people. In fact, this history bears us out. Sin is pervasive with all skin tones. And so just isolating the term whiteness and onboarding, on, onboarding all these negative things is radically disingenuous. How about this one, Neil? Uh, justice is part of the gospel. If you hear that in your church, what should you say? I would say, again, define justice, define the gospel. The big problem with this slogan is that it, usually people are thinking in terms of Doing social justice is part of the gospel. And the big problem here is that doing social justice is something that we do. It's an activity. It's an imperative. You might think, well, we ought to do social justice. Okay, let's say you do. But what's the gospel? The gospel is the good news, the indicative statement of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, period. It's we receive the gospel. We don't perform the gospel. So... You're, conf you're, you're confusing what we ought to do in response to the gospel with the gospel itself. That's ex extremely pernicious error. So I would want to say you can, as a Christian, as an evangelical, you can say the gospel should motivate us to pursue biblical justice, should motivate us to do a lot of other things like be sexually pure, it should motivate us to love our neighbor, it should motivate us to be generous. But those things are not the gospel. The gospel is the good news that even though we do not do those things, we do not obey God's law, that Jesus bore our sin on the cross and rose from the dead so that we who are unjust could be made righteous. So we want to keep those two ideas of what Jesus did for us and what we do in response to him very distinct. And Frank, what we're going to say that, Frank, Frank, one of the yeah. things that we have seen by people adopting that mentality, infolding into the gospel pursuits of justice, now we see certain national Christians and national ministries that have morphed from something that was concerned about sound doctrine and spiritual perspectives and salvation spiritually primarily, now they're all about temporal justice, working for temporal justice. And so that ethnic identity wrapped up into the social binary is now, is now the leading, dominating aspects of these ministries that we have in view. And so now the gospel has been displaced for efforts to emancipate those who are marginalized and disenfranchised, giving temporal justice. And now we've, we, we've, we're pushing a counterfeit gospel at this point with some of those. Not, yeah, so that's the concern. Not only that, but it, it really seems like the anti Martin Luther King philosophy. You know, he, of course, famously said, on, uh, I have a dream that my four children will be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Doesn't it seem like this is the opposite of that? That people are now going to be judged by the color of their skin and you're going to treat people differently based on what ethnic group they're in rather than just on the content of their character, how they behave. Neil, am I missing this? No, actually, is, is that what's interestingly, going on? At the critical race theory in its origination in the 1980s and 90s 
it was explicitly contrasting itself to the vision of the civil rights movement. They were insisting that the civil rights movement had not succeeded ultimately because they were operating on this egalitarian uh, sort of classical liberal framework that wanted equality. And they really should have been working uh, from a critical standpoint, which did recognize more about power dynamics and the inherent injustice of the law. A great example we go through in the book is how uh, King interpreted the Constitution as being for the equality of blacks and whites, whereas critical race theory would view these documents as actually enshrining white supremacy at its core. So they take a totally different approach, even to the law. You, again, we go through this in our book, but you can see how they approach our founding documents. King as seeing them as uh, basically writing checks for black emancipation, whereas critical race theorists would see them ultimately as enshrining white dominance. Diametrically opposed views. Okay, uh, Pat, is critical race theory in any way compatible with orthodox Christianity? If you approach critical race theory from a robust standpoint, onboarding it as a whole or in the main, then it is opposed to biblical Christianity. There are aspects of critical race theory that are in fact true, so they're not opposed to, to biblical Christianity. They're, for instance, critical race theory is concerned about racism. Well, so it's, it's real Christianity is concerned about racism. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to onboard all of critical race theory, then we have to take critical race theory's approach to the interlocking system of oppressions that are part and parcel to society. And then when we do that, now we have to adopt uh, queer theory's agenda for the gay rights movement. We have to adopt uh, issues around how to think about men and women in the church and, and around complementarianism and egalitarianism. We've got to think about the differently abled in a way that now runs counter to aspects of, of biblical Christianity, recognizing the, the fall and what took place with the fall and how that's impacted our bodies. We have to flip the script on how we think about uh, just human bodies and time and space that will start to run concurrent and at odds with the Christian faith. Do you gentlemen have uh, a few more minutes because we're running out of time here and I'd like to maybe extend this to the midweek podcast because I have several more questions. Is that okay? Do you guys have yeah, more time? I'm fine. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Yeah, friends, uh, there's so much great in this book. I have a few more uh, insights I want to get from Neil and Pat. So we'll cover that on the midweek podcast coming up on Tuesday. Those of you listening on the American Family Radio Network, it will not be broadcast on radio. You have to go to the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist podcast. And this coming Tuesday, the second half of this interview will be released. In the meantime, wherever you get books, uh, well, actually, there's a website. What's the website, Neil, for the book? CriticalDilemma.com. Go to criticaldilemma.com. You can read the endorsements there, maybe uh, a few pages of a book before you buy it. Uh, check it out, but you do you do want to get this book. It is the new standard on this topic, and you need to know about it because it's coming toward your church, so be ready. And Lord willing, folks, we will see you here on Tuesday. God bless. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast may not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family... 90.5 KTXG Greenville, Dallas. State employee, you have the opportunity to support the American Family Association through the combined federal campaign by designating a monthly payroll deduction using 12037. You help ASA continue to fight for your family. So when you complete your CFC form, remember ASA's number is 12037. And thank you for your help. This is American Family Radio, a listener supported ministry of the American Family Association. is the Middle East Report, your connection to truthful reporting on Israel and the Middle East. I'm John Riley. Thanks for listening. On this time of growing anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, and Jew hatred across our country, governments, on college campuses, and even among some churches, there's one organization that is doing something about that. They're encouraging everybody to stand in solidarity with Israel and the Jewish people, and that organization is the Jerusalem Connection. 
encourage you to find out more about that organization when you go to the Jerusalem Connection dot us. Amy Zawi is the vice president of the Jerusalem Connection, and she's with us today on the Middle East Report. Amy, something that has concerned me for quite a while now is the growing lack of support of young people for Israel and for the Jewish people. What are your thoughts on that? What do you think is going on? If you get this this feeling or this vibe from your pulpit, from your clergy, that that Jewish people are incidental, they don't matter, or God forbid the, the denomination subscribes to, you know, the deicide, you know, that the Jews killed Jesus, the Jews killed God, etc. Then yeah, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a negative feeling towards these people when you get to college and when you get into the workplace, or you're gonna slough off if you see a celebrity say something bad about about Jewish people collectively, you're going to go, it's not my problem, I don't care, but it should be your problem, you should care, because without the Jewish people, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't even have the Septuagint, we wouldn't even have the rich resources that, that Christianity relies on today for the authenticity of our Bible, we wouldn't even, you can't even understand the New Testament, like a lot of people read the Bible, they don't even understand it, well, if you don't understand it, because you don't read your Old Testament. It's very frustrating and it's why the people I work with are so dedicated to just doing what we can, where we can. And and what I think is happening is there's a lack of study of the Hebrew scriptures of, of the Old Testament in general, even among denominations or, or particular churches and universities that aren't necessarily teaching replacement theology, but their lack of addressing the role of Israel in um, in the scripture and what we can learn from, from the Hebrew scripture. So that's one part of it. It's a lack of understanding of the reality of, of what God says about Israel and Jewish people. Couple that with a cultural tide of this social justice movement where the, the um, Palestinian cause has really taken a, a, a strong foothold. That narrative creeps into other college campuses where Israel is is the oppressor. Israel is an occupying, you know, colonial occupying force in the land. And, and they're buying into that without knowing even the truth about what happened, you know, in the last 150 years, why, why there was even a resurgence of Jewish people in the land of Israel to begin with, and why so many European Jews started to go to Israel and repopulate it in the late 1800s. Nobody knows the reality of that history. It's, it's just being omitted. It's omitted from secular history courses, and it's being omitted from... Um, Christian schools, their history courses. So that's just plain real history that they're not teaching completely um, and with care. And then amongst the Christian community, I think it's a lack of attention to 